Welcome back. Um, we'll begin the next session, um, which is orthopox virus uh, vaccine. Um, an introduction by Dr. Bell uh, will uh, now begin. Uh, Dr. Bell, please take it over. Uh, hello and good morning or good afternoon. Um, this morning, uh, the, uh, yeah, whatever it is, morning or the afternoon. Uh, could you go back to the first slide, please? Thank you. Um, so um, the um, Orthopox virus work group was formed in order to update the ACIP recommendations to include the use of Gineos vaccine to prevent orthopox viruses in persons at risk for occupational exposure. Next, please. Um, so the work group uh, includes uh, ACIP members, myself and Pablo Sanchez. Um, and you can see here the list of ex officio members, liaison representatives, and uh, invited consultants. Next, please. We have a, a wide array of CDC contributors from a number of different uh, parts of the agency, uh, all of whose contributions we greatly appreciate. Next, please. So the work group has been meeting uh, for some time now, and uh, what we've been up to um, includes reviewing and evaluating the available data about the safety and eff effectiveness of Gineos vaccine. We have been considering uh, consolidating the U.S. recommendations for vaccination of persons who may have been, had occupational exposure to orthopox viruses, and we've um, been identifying areas in need of further research for informing future vaccine recommendations to prevent orthopox virus infection. Next. So as uh, you may recall, a lot has happened since then, but um, we did announce formation of the um, work group at the October uh, ACIP meeting and began meeting um, monthly in uh, February of 2020. Um, so uh, we reviewed uh, we, three background presentations about um, the scope of our work. Uh, um, looking at um, data about this newly licensed orthopox virus vaccine. Um, the trade name is Gineos, but it's also known by these other um, names. It makes it somewhat confusing sometimes to keep track of the vaccine, so you might just sort of keep that in your mind. For persons at uh, risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses, we reviewed the ACIP recommendations published over the last approximately 20 years relevant to orthopox viruses. We um, had a presentation by the manufacturer uh, involving data that contributed to the licensure of uh, Gineos. And we, um, excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> Sorry. We evaluated data presented by CDC about the variola PRNT data and preliminary immunogenicity data from monkeypox vaccine, from a monkeypox vaccine study in um, the DRC using Gineos. And you will be um, also hearing some of this information at today's meeting. Next, please. Uh, we've also um, been um, uh, working to uh, assemble the da data in uh, the format that we use with the ACIP. So we've drafted a PICO question after reviewing examples. We've identified outcomes that we've considered to be critical or important and which should therefore be included in GRADE and the Evidence to Recommendations Framework. Um, we um, confirmed the scope of uh, the recommendations um, that the considerations will be limited to those at occupational risk pre-event. We began discussions about which occupations, for example, laboratorians should be included in this update, noting that um, some previous recommendations that are now uh, 20 years old almost um, included uh, broad occupational groups and we've uh, been preparing for a systematic review of the published literature um, by um, determining the search terms and then have begun the review. Next. So our goal for today is to begin the process of making detailed presentations to the ACIP to provide background information and the proposed PICO question in preparation for grade and the evidence to recommendations presentations, which will happen at the next meeting, and um, give the, the ACIP um, opportunity to uh, ask questions, uh, which we can answer about the work group's progress and uh, our presentations today. Next, please. So this is a detailed uh, list of uh, the agenda. Um, 
Brett Peterson from CDC will be presenting some background information. We'll hear um, about um, the neutralization assay um, for um, assessment of uh, Genius uh, vaccines uh, from vaccinated individuals. Uh, we'll hear from the manufacturer Bavarian Nordic. Um, Brett will be back uh, and will um, provide us with some information about an ongoing study in the DRC using um, this vaccine um, to vaccinate against monkeypox. And then Agam Rao from CDC will uh, provide a summary and um, advise the, uh, let the ACIP know about what we think will be our next steps. Next. So thank you very much. And uh, why don't we continue um, with our presentations? Thank you, Dr. Bell. Uh, Dr. Peterson, please, on Orthopox work group background. Great, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon or good morning to everybody. Um, as they pull up the slides here, I'll just introduce myself. My name is uh, Brett Peterson. I am the epidemiology team lead here in CDC's pox virus and rabies branch, and I am the co-lead for the Orthopox virus work group. And my goal for this first presentation of our session is to provide uh, some background on the orthopox viruses. Um, I'll give an introduction to the currently licensed orthopox virus vaccines. And lastly, I'll give a brief overview of the current uh, ACIP recommendations. So the pox viruses are a family of DNA viruses that infect a broad range of hosts. The orthopox virus genus within this family includes several species that cause disease in humans. And these diseases can range from isolated lesions to uh, systemic rash illness. Um, variola virus is the most commonly known orthopox virus. It's the causative agent of smallpox. Uh, vaccinia virus is the principal source of smallpox vaccine. It also causes zoonotic infections in South America, and it's also used fairly widely in biological research. Monkeypox virus causes both endemic and epidemic disease in Africa, as well as imported cases to other countries, including the U.S. Cowpox virus is endemic in Europe, and there are even newly discovered orthopox virus species, including Akhmetavirus, which was discovered in the country of Georgia, uh, as well as Alaska pox virus, which um, has occurred here in the United States. And it's the ability of orthopox viruses to induce cross protective immunity that has led to the use of vaccinia virus as a smallpox vaccine. The traditional smallpox vaccines contain live virus, they are replication comp competent, and they're administered in a single dose, dose via multiple puncture technique using a bifurcated needle, as seen here. This process produces a major cutaneous reaction or take, which is actually evidence of a successful vaccination. However, these vaccine site lesions, as you can see here in the image, uh, are infectious and can be spread to other parts of the body of the vaccine and to other persons through inadvertent inoculation. ACAM 2000 is the currently available smallpox vaccine. It was licensed by FDA in August of 2007. It replaced the previous smallpox vaccine, Drivax, and Drivax's license was actually withdrawn by the manufacturer and remaining vaccine was destroyed. ACAM 2000 is indicated for active immunization against smallpox disease for persons determined to be at high risk for smallpox infection. The package insert does contain contraindications and recommends that individuals with severe immunodeficiency who are not expected to benefit from the vaccine should not receive ACAM 2000. Further describes these individuals as those who are undergoing bone marrow transplantation or individuals with primary or acquired immunodeficiency who require isolation. Package insert also includes a number of warnings and precautions. Um, including a black box warning for the uh, serious adverse events, which are listed here and which we'll describe in a little bit more detail in a further slide. Uh, it notes that these risks are increased in certain individuals and may result in severe disability, permanent neurological sequelae, and or death. However, it does go on to further note that persons at greatest risk of experiences, experiencing serious vaccination complications are often those at greatest risk for death from smallpox or other orthopox virus infections. 
And consequently, the risk for experiencing serious vaccination complications must be weighed against the risk for experiencing a potentially fatal smallpox or other orthopox virus infection. Now, with respect to those severe vaccinia virus complications, uh, progressive vaccinia is seen in the first image. Uh, this is a complication that occurs in persons with immunosuppression and leads to um, uncontrolled replication of the virus and often death. Eczema vaccinatum, seen in the second image, is another complication resulting in uncontrolled replication of the virus, which is often seen in persons with atopic dermatitis. This can also have high mortality. Post-vaccinal encephalitis occurs most commonly in the pediatric populations. Fetal vaccinia has been observed uh, with vaccinia virus vaccines in which there is vertical transmission of the virus to the fetus resulting in fetal loss. We mentioned auto inoculation as well as inadvertent transmission. And these can be significant problems when the virus is spread to areas on the body with um, high risk of severe uh, sequelae, including ocular infections, which have often resulted in blindness. Myopericarditis is also associated with ACAM2000. And although the exact mechanism of action of this adverse event is, is not completely understood, uh, it continues to be a problem. And in an effort to improve smallpox vaccines, there have been many advances made in vaccine technology. The first generation vaccines were those used in the smallpox eradication campaign, and these were actually propagated in animals, most commonly calf skin. The second generation vaccines um, are now propagated in tissue culture and produced using modern good manufacturing practices. However, they're almost equivalent. They're uh, clonally derived from the first generation vaccines and so are expected to have similar efficacy and safety. Um, in contrast, the third generation vaccines are those that have been attenuated um, through propagation and tissue culture. However, these are also still produced using good manufacturing practices. Fourth generation vaccines have also been developed, but they're still uh, experimental and not yet available. Genios is an example of these third generation vaccines. It is a live vaccine produced from the strain modified Vaccinia Ankara Bavarian Nordic. It's an attenuated non-replicating orthopox virus. As Dr. Bell mentioned, it has a number of other names, Invimune, Invinex, MVA. Um, this vaccine is grown in primary chicken embryo fibroblast cells and it's multiple passages through these cells that have left it unable to replicate in mammalian cells. Uh, this vaccine was approved by FDA in September 2019. Genios is indicated for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox disease in adults 18 years of age and older determined to be at high risk for smallpox or monkeypox infection. It's administered uh, via subcutaneous injection it's given in two doses, four weeks apart, and each 0.5 milliliter dose is supplied in a single dose vial. The package insert does list uh, solicited adverse reactions, including injection site reactions and systemic adverse reactions. Um, however, the rates of these are similar to other uh, modern vaccines. Uh, of note, um, this vaccine has been studied in populations at high risk for severe vaccine complications, including persons with HIV infection, as well as uh, adults with atopic dermatitis. And none of the severe vaccine complications we described were seen in these populations. And the frequency of the adverse reactions um, were also similar to those observed in healthy adults. Across all of the studies, there were four severe adverse events in which a causal relationship to genios could not be excluded. These included Crohn's disease, sarcoidosis, extraocular muscle paresis, and throat tightness. However, all of these were not fatal. Um, there were also six cases of cardiac adverse events of special interest. They're listed here. Um, it's of note, none of these were considered serious, and there were no cases of myopericarditis that were identified um, in clinical trials to date. With respect to vaccine effectiveness, the vaccine's effectiveness was 
against smallpox was inferred by comparing the immunogenicity of Genios to the currently licensed smallpox vaccine, ACAME 2000, um, using a plaque reduction neutralization test or print. Um, and it was also supported by efficacy data from animal challenge studies. Similarly, the vaccine effectiveness against monkeypox was also inferred from both immunogenicity as well as uh, efficacy data from animal challenge studies. So moving on to describe the current ACIP recommendations for orthopox viruses. The latest recommendations uh, were from 2015 and described the use of vaccinia virus smallpox vaccine in laboratory and healthcare personnel at risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses. As mentioned previously, uh, vaccinia virus is used as a tool in biological research as well as um, a, a viral vector for recombinant vaccines. And we do still see uh, laboratory exposures and um, resulting infections um, in this population. To prevent these infections, ACIP does recommend routine vaccination with ACAM2000 for laboratory workers who directly handle A, cultures, or B, animals contaminated or infected with replication competent vaccinia virus, recombinant vaccine, vaccinia viruses derived from replication competent vaccinia strains, or other orthopox viruses that infect humans, for example, monkeypox, cowpox, and variola. Goes on to define replication competent vaccine virus as those that are capable of causing clinical infection and producing infectious virus in humans. <clears throat> uh, vaccination with AKM2000 is not recommended for persons who work only with replication deficient strains of vaccine virus, for example, MVA, which is the, <clears throat> the strain used for Genios. In terms of healthcare workers, um, those whose contact with replication competent vaccine viruses is limited, is limited to contaminated materials, for example, dressings, and persons administering AKM2000 smallpox vaccine who adhere to appropriate infection prevention measures can be offered vaccination with AKM2000. ACIP lists a number of contraindications uh, in order to prevent those severe vaccine complications we've described. The high-risk populations that are contraindicated are listed here. And of note, even um, potential vaccinees who have household contacts uh, with uh, uh, among these several of these um, high-risk populations, they are also contraindicated. Um, out of completeness, uh, further details and descriptions of uh, these contraindications are listed here. ACIP also has recommendations for revaccination of laboratory and healthcare personnel. For those uh, individuals working with vaccinia viruses, uh, the recommendation is that they be revaccinated at least every 10 years. And for those working with more virulent orthopox viruses like variola or monkeypox, they should be vaccinated every three years. As Dr. Bell also alluded to, there is a 2003 ACIP recommendation document uh, describing the use of smallpox vaccine in a pre-event vaccination program. These recommendations uh, do recommend smallpox vaccination for both smallpox response teams as well as smallpox healthcare teams. Uh, with the goal of having a cadre of vaccinated uh, individuals who are uh, able to investigate in the event of uh, possible uh, smallpox um, outbreak and to provide care for uh, any uh, initial um, smallpox cases. These recommendations do not provide uh, advice or guidance for revaccination um, and a memo was produced in October 2008 to address this issue. Um, and in this uh, memo, it was recommended that uh, individuals vaccinated under this pre-event smallpox program um, would only be revaccinated in an as needed or out the door basis in the event of an emergency. So lastly, with respect to how much vaccine uh, is actually being distributed. Um, all of the AKIM 2000 is provided by CDC's drug services. They receive approximately 100 requests for AKIM 2000 per year. However, the vaccine is actually distributed as 100 dose vials. And so we believe that this number of requests likely represents 
approximately 100 to 200 individuals vaccinated per year. And uh, of these requests, uh, around five of them are for smallpox response teams, and this may represent um, five to 10 individuals vaccinated per year. But clearly, the vast majority of um, vaccine that's currently being administered is for those laboratory and healthcare uh, worker populations. So, with that, I will end and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that um, very uh, thorough uh, review, um, Dr. Peterson. We're open for questions. Work group members, Dr. Lee. Thanks so much for the um, really thorough presentation. Just one question about healthcare personnel um, who might be exposed. You had mentioned physicians and nurses. Are there other healthcare personnel who might be exposed to potentially contaminated materials where it'd be important to consider them as well? Yeah, so with regards to the healthcare personnel, the, the folks that we expect may be exposed would be those who might be either administering ACAM 2000, uh, having follow-up visits to uh, evaluate vaccine site lesions, um, or those who may be actually um, taking care of people who are receiving um, experimental recombinant vaccine virus vaccines. Um, it's, it's not a large population. Um, we would expect it largely to be physicians or nurses. Um, so that is what the healthcare personnel recommendation is really directed at. Okay. And just to clarify, and so thinking about contaminant, like if there's wound dressing changes or things like that, um, is there any uh, worry about uh, contaminated dressings and, and environmental services workers or things of that sort? So if the contaminated dressings are um, taken care of according to recommendation, they, they should be essentially placed in biohazard bags um, with the addition of bleach or another uh, viricidal agent. And so if those precautions are being followed, there's really very little risk that there would be any potential exposures to um, others in the environmental services or, or, or other sectors. Thank you. Any other questions from the uh, voting members? Any questions from the liaisons? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Weidenthalmer, uh, who will present uh, Genios uh, MVABN smallpox and monkeypox vaccine from Bavarian Nordic. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Heinz Weidenthaler. I'm VP of Clinical Strategy at Bavarian Nordic, and I will be talking today about our modified vaccinia Ankara or MVABN smallpox and monkeypox vaccine, uh, which in the US has the brand name of Genius, and as Dr. Peterson has mentioned, is also known under the brand names of Imbamune and Imbonex in Canada and in Europe. So to start with, I will provide some background information on smallpox vaccines, or rather, let's say, orthopox virus vaccines. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and uh, also provide some background on the development history of uh, Genius. I will then go into some details about the safety data and the FDA approval. And finally, I will dive into some of the clinical data that have ultimately supported the approval. And we will look into the phase three data that uh, compared uh, Genius versus a replicating smallpox vaccine, um, and also into some data in immunocompromised subjects and into data on durability. On the next slide. So why did we develop a pox virus vaccine at all, knowing that smallpox is eradicated since the late 1970s? I think, first of all, although it's eradicated, smallpox may, of course, remain a biosecurity threat, especially when we are taking into account that there are now methods of biosynthesis. And quite recently, there was a publication out there reporting about the de novo creation of uh, an infectious horsepox virus from the scratch, basically from commercially available DNA fragments. And, and this knowledge is out there and published. But also in addition to smallpox, the, the orthopox virus field as a whole is somewhat wider. There are natural diseases out there such as monkeypox or camelpox. Uh, particularly monkeypox is causing human infections. And one of the reasons why human monkeypox infections are rising is the fact that since the eradication of smallpox, uh, there are no longer any routine smallpox vaccination. 
which means that after this was stopped in the late 1970s, we have today in 2020 about half the population, so the younger half of the population, that has never received a pox virus-based vaccine, making the population overall more vulnerable to pox virus infections. Other topics may include lab research with replicating or the pox viruses where lab personnel may be accidentally exposed or even, even worse where virus might be accidentally released. On the next slide, I won't go into too much detail because Dr. Peterson will be covering this in uh, the next talk. Um, just uh, mentioning that uh, monkeypox is uh, also a threat beyond the, the African endemic countries with some recent cases of travelers who have brought it to some Western world countries, um, including secondary transmissions to, to healthcare workers that were observed in the UK. Next slide. And also here, uh, it's a repetition of what Dr. Peterson has just shown, so I don't go too much into details. There are these complications of the replicating smallpox vaccines. Uh, the more recently one identified was myopericarditis, which was uh, identified only after the smallpox eradication campaign when the vaccines were used in the post 9-11 setting in a larger scale vaccination campaign. Um, based on that experience, uh, we had a very close focus on cardiac adverse events during the whole development program of Genius, and we finally developed this product as a safe alternative uh, smallpox vaccine to the previous replicating ones, uh, also having in mind that there are a lot of people showing contraindications, and we wanted to create something that is suitable for all populations. Next slide. So what is Genius? It's essentially a live attenuated but non-replicating in all human cell lines tested strain of modified vaccinia ankara that is indicated for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox disease. Um, it's FDA approved since September last year uh, for use in the adult population determined to be at high risk for smallpox or monkeypox infection. Um, with regard to the safety profile, it's important to note that we have not seen a signal of inflammatory cardiac disorders. Um, and uh, as mentioned, it, we, we included uh, immunocompromised subjects and atopic dermatitis subjects in our development program. And as such, it is also suitable for these populations. The standard dose regimen as of the approved label is a two-dose regimen of the subcutaneous injection of genius uh, four weeks apart. Next slide. This is summarizing on a high level the overall development program that we were running over the past two decades. You can see that we have enrolled very different populations, so both healthy individuals but also at-risk subjects including immunocompromised subjects or um, patients diagnosed with atopic dermatitis who cannot receive the traditional replicating smallpox vaccines. In total, the trial program has included more than 7,800 subjects in the completed trial so far. And I will go into details of some of these trials later on. Um, just want to mention here that uh, a number of these trials have received support from US governmental institutions such as the NIH or BARDA, which we are very grateful for. Next slide. I'm summarizing the safety data here. Based on the data set uh, we have submitted for approval, uh, including these 22 trials with over 7,800 subjects, we have seen that the vast majority of events were those that we captured as so-called solicited events using a diary card scheme where we have a very um, yeah, close surveillance of uh, adverse reactions throughout the first seven days post-vaccination uh, by reported directly by the subjects. We have seen that uh, the vast majority of events are these local injection site reactions that are usually mild to moderate in intensity and uh, resolved rapidly without need for intervention. We have seen no trends or clusters for unexpected or serious adverse reactions. The number of cardiac adverse events of special interest that were considered causally related to the vaccination were rather small. None of those were considered serious. And importantly, we have not seen signals of cardiac inflammatory disorders in the whole development program. Um, also of note, when we look at the different populations, um, there are no relevant differences of the safety profile between uh, the younger vaccinia naive population or the little bit older uh, vaccinia experienced populations, but also not between the healthy and the at risk populations, so the atopic dermatitis or HIV positive populations. Um, of note, we also have um, 
um, done some research. Um, but basically, we are using this uh, MVABN uh, smallpox vaccine as a platform technology uh, for viral vectors uh, targeted at other infectious diseases when we are um, inserting antigens of other um, other viruses. So we have, uh, for example, developed the, the MVABN phylo vaccine, which is licensed to Janssen. Um, they have used this as the boosting component in their heterologous Ebola vaccination regimen. Um, it's based on this uh, MVABN construct, um, and the total exposure in this development program is now uh, above uh, 40,000 subjects, which, uh, when you look at the platform as a whole, of course, contributed very much to the safety database. And the safety profile of the recombinant products uh, based on this vector platform is very similar to the safety profile that we have seen with the backbone vaccine, the smallpox vaccine itself. Next slide. Um, going a little bit more into, into the cardiac safety, because this has really been of interest with the replicating vaccines with those issues around myo and pericarditis. Uh, because of that experience, we've had a very close monitoring in all our trials. Uh, we were looking out for cardiac events, which included targeted physical exams, ECGs and troponin testing, pre and post vaccinations. Um, of course, we usually had inclusion criteria in our uh, healthy volunteer trials that included troponin below twice the upper limit of normal and uh, reasonably healthy ECGs without clinically significant findings, uh, no previous cardiac diseases in the history. Um, in the whole development program with the smallpox vaccine itself with the 7,800 subjects, we have seen these uh, six cases of potentially causally related uh, adverse events of special interest that were all rather non-specific events, ECG changes, tachycardia palpitations, but none of them being serious. Um, and importantly, no signal of uh, uh, inflammatory uh, cardiac disorders. Uh, on the next slide, I focus a little bit on um, the at-risk population. So, um, of course, we had these cardiac inclusion exclusion criteria in the young and healthy volunteers, but some trials also had these special populations where the inclusion criteria were less strict. Um, in one of the trials, we looked at the vaccinia experienced population, so the older half of the population. Um, and for those, of course, we had to allow a little bit more pre existing disorders in the inclusion criteria. So in this trial, we allowed subjects with a previous history of cardiac ischemic disorders when this was at least two years ago. Um, we also allowed those with a cardiac risk score for major cardiac events of up to 25% using this cardiac risk calculator, uh, or those on chronic medications such as low dose aspirin. Um, I have to note that the trial subjects in this vaccine experienced trial was 56 and above, but at least parts of the population also met the definition of elderly being above 65. When we looked at the cardiac safety data in those special population studies, uh, also the other at-risk populations like HIV and atopic dermatitis, um, we again saw no difference between the healthy volunteer groups and the more at-risk groups, also in terms of ischemic or cardi uh, inflammatory cardiac disorders. On the next slide, I'm summarizing here the key differences between the replicating smallpox vaccines and the non-replicating MVA or genius. So the first difference, of course, is the, the administration, which is the scarification with a bifurcated needle on the side of the replicating vaccinia strains. Um, on, on our end, of course, it's a, a routine standard subcutaneous uh, injection with that uh, uh, standard two dose scheduled four weeks apart. And uh, as the, the MVA strain is non-replicative in human cells, of course, it will not cause um, such a um, cutaneous reaction or take reaction. It also is not able to cause transmission uh, either within the vaccinated subject or to other individuals, um, which makes it uh, a vaccine that is suitable for the overall population, including those um, who are contraindicated for the replicating vaccines. And of course, one of the key differences is uh, in, uh, in terms of the cardiac safety, um, where we have not seen myocarditis cases in more than 10,000 subjects dosed with uh, chinias, which includes two ongoing studies, uh, or more than 50,000 when you take into account the whole MVABN vector platform. Next slide. So now let me jump into some of the key clinical data. 
Um, and let me start with the pivotal phase three trial that we did, which was a head-to-head -head non inferiority trial versus the replicating vaccinia strain versus ACAM 2000. We had two co-primary objectives um, in this trial. On the immunogenicity side, we wanted to show non-inferiority of MVABN as compared to ACAM 2000 when looking at the peak responses for vaccinia specific neutralizing antibodies uh, using the PRNT. Um, comparing the peak visit time point. So we knew from historic data that the peak visit for MVA is two weeks after the second vaccination, which is day 42 into the trial. Uh, and for the replicating vaccine, it's four weeks after the single vaccination. Uh, the endpoint here was the PRNT geometric mean titers at the peak visits. Um, on the efficacy side, uh, we used a kind of surrogate of efficacy endpoint. Uh, we were looking at um, what happens when we are vaccinating subjects first with MVA and then with ACAM 2000, uh, because you would expect uh, also some kind of protection against you know, all orthopox viruses and as such also protection against the growth of ACAM 2000 in the skin after the routine administration. Uh, ACAM 2000 basically is a replicating vaccinia, another orthopox virus strain. Um, so we have defined a measure for this, uh, for this readout, which is the so-called maximum lesion area, which we measured uh, in, in both groups. And we have compared uh, those two groups and, and uh, calculated the attenuation of this lesion area um, in subjects who received ACIM after the MVA regimen as compared to those who re received ACIM uh, straight away. On the next slide, you will see the trial design, which is obvious after this explanation that the group one subjects received uh, the standard um, schedule of MVA four weeks apart, which was followed another four weeks later by uh, scarification with ACAM 2000. The comparator group, group two, received uh, the replicating vaccine ACAM 2000 right away at day zero. Uh, and jumping right into the results for the immunogenicity on the next slide. So what you see here um, is the geometric mean titers for the neutralizing antibodies uh, the vaccinia specific PRNT over time. And I will spend a few seconds on this slide. First of all, um, for your orientation, the solid line is the group one subjects, those subjects who received uh, the two doses of MVABN at uh, day zero and day 28. That's the red arrows uh, at the bottom here. Uh, the dotted line is the group two subjects, those subjects who received ACAM 2000 on day zero. Um, that's the, the blue dotted arrow on the bottom. So first, let's look at the primary endpoint, which was uh, um, non-inferiority of MVA versus ACIM in terms of peak neutralizing antibody response. Um, we see that the peak time points were matching with our expectations. So it's uh, the week six time point for the MVA group and the week four time point for the ACIM group. You see immediately on this slide that in terms of comparing the peaks, uh, we actually have reached the primary endpoint here. So we have uh, proven non-inferiority. Actually, the neutralizing titers for MVA in the vaccinia-specific PRNT are almost twice as high as those for ACAM 2000. Please bear in mind that we have a logarithmic scale here. Um, also, when you look at the confidence intervals, these are very narrow. Um, and although this was not a pre-specified analysis, but if we had looked at superiority purely statistically, we would have proven it here. Um, the primary endpoint of non-inferiority, of course, was met, and uh, that's basically why it's now approved for smallpox. But there's uh, more information on that slide. When you look at the, the earlier time point on this graph, the, the week two time point, um, this is a time point when the group one subjects have received only one single vaccination with genius. The group two subjects obviously have received the one and only single administration of ACAM 2000. When you look at this week two time point after the single vaccination, basically all of the um, um, data points, the two data points are overlapping. Um, and the at this point of time, all of the ACAM 2000 subjects have already developed this major cutaneous reaction or take reaction, which is the traditional readout of a successful vac vaccination. So the marker of protection. At this early time point, the neutralizing antibody responses are yeah, identical. The data points are overlapping. And this is an important information when it comes to potential emergency scenarios. So the, the genius vaccinated subjects will have an equal neutralizing immune response already after that single vaccination as compared 
to the ACAM 2000 uh, immunogenicity at a time point when ACAM is considered protective based on the traditional readout. Still, of course, the standard regimen remains the uh, two-dose regimen uh, in the four weeks interval. Moving to the conclusions of our phase three data, we have proven non-inferiority um, to the replicating vaccines in term of, terms of peak immunogenicity, which is why the product is approved. For the other co-primary endpoint, the take attenuation, uh, I don't have the data drawn up here, but uh, also this one was uh, achieved in, in terms of uh, reduction of the maximum lesion area. Um, so we have shown that those subjects who received Chinias first and then the scarification with AECAM um, had a significant suppression of growth of another orthopox virus, in this case, the replicating vaccine strain AECAM 2000 which is an indicator of, um, of vaccine efficacy towards other orthopox viruses. Um, it was safe and well tolerated in this study, uh, also showed a significantly better tolerability as compared to the group two uh, ECAM 2000 subjects in terms of the overall adverse event rates. Um, and as mentioned, importantly for the potential emergency scenario, it already showed an equal level of neutralizing antibodies at the time point after the first single vaccination at the week two time point when ACAM is already considered protective based on the traditional uh, efficacy readout. Um, going now into detail on uh, some data we generated in the immunocompromised population, um, I have prepared uh, an overview of a phase two uh, study in, in the HIV positive populations on the next slide here. You see that we have enrolled 87 subjects uh, with a history of, uh, of AIDS, in fact. So they had a minimum CD4 count, a historic minimum CD4 count of below 200 per microliter, which is an AIDS-defining condition. At the time of enrollment, they still had to be somewhere between 100 and 500 uh, CD4 cells per microliter. We looked at different doses and schedules of genius in this trial. What's important here to see for you on the, on the graph of the right-hand side is the red solid line here. That's the standard dose and schedule. And what we see is that the peak neutralizing response is basically of the same magnitude as we have seen also in the phase three trial in the healthy subjects, which I've copied to the left here. We are comparing data from two different trials here, but uh, please bear in mind that we analyzed the samples in the same labs using the same validated PRNT assay. So that's why we are comparing these readouts here. What we also see is that the magnitude of the peak in the uh, immunocompromised population with a standard dose and regimen is very similar also to the peak um, that we've seen in the healthy population using the replicating uh, smallpox vaccine ACAM 2000. So we are concluding uh, on the next slide, we are concluding that uh, there are basically no clinically relevant differences between these different doses and schedules that we have tested in the HIV positive population and that the uh, established standard dose and regimen um, is also confirmed uh, to be adequate for the severely immunocompromised uh, vaccine naive population with an HIV infection. Regarding the safety, it was equally safe and well tolerated um, as we have seen for the healthy population. Um, and that was also the same for the different uh, doses and schedules that we have tested. And moving on to the final piece of information, I have drawn up some data from on durability that we generated from a, uh, an initial phase two core study and a follow-on study that we've conducted two years later. Um, on the next slide, I'm introducing you to the trial design here. Uh, on the left-hand side, I've summarized the trial design of the initial phase two study where we have enrolled more than 700 subjects in, in different dose groups. For the vaccine and Eve subjects, we have compared the standard two-dose regimen versus a single-dose regimen we also had a group in there who received, uh, who had previously received smallpox vaccination, so a vaccine experienced group. Those received in this phase two trial only one single uh, MVA kind of boost vaccination. Uh, and we also had a placebo group. And then after this trial was completed, we waited for two years and brought back a subset of the previous participants from the two initially vaccine naive dose groups, uh, the, the single or the two dose regimen and administered another dose of MVA, a boost dose, uh, to those subjects two years later, two years after the initial vaccination regimen. On the next slide, you will see the 
immunogenicity readouts of these two trials. So first have a look on the left-hand side. Um, you'll see the two solid lines here on the uh, left-hand side showing the vaccinia naive dose groups. Um, what you see here is a very similar picture to what you have seen before in our phase three data. So we see some increase at the week two time point. Uh, with a single dose group, it will reach a plateau by week four after the single vaccination. Uh, the two dose regimen with a second vaccination at week four shows a clear peak then at week six with a further increase, which is very similar to what we have seen before for our phase three data. Interestingly, the previously vaccinated vaccinia experienced subjects, that's the dotted line here, um, they received only one single dose of MBABN and they received a, a similar level of peak already after that single boost vaccination. Um, so that was the core study. Uh, now, after we waited for two years and have re-enrolled the initially vaccine naive subjects two years later for the single boost vaccination, this is what you can see here, see here on the graph of the right-hand side. Um, what you see here is an increase of the titer um, that is very clear and very fast already at the week one time point. Um, so uh, the, the immunogenicity readout at week one is already similarly high as the uh, initial peak readout in the core study following the, the standard two dose regimen. Um, and this is something that we see for both groups, interestingly, regardless of whether the subjects had initially a one dose or a two dose regimen. Um, we see the peak then at the week two time point post boost, which is basically identical for the two groups, no matter whether the subjects initially had the single um, dose or the standard two dose regimen two years earlier. And what we are concluding from this is that the antibody responses, um, yeah, at the two years time point are indicating a strong memory cell based uh, boost response based on the fact that we see a very high level already at week one, which is uh, something that uh, we don't see in the in the initially, uh, we don't see at the in a vaccine naive population when they are receiving the first vaccinations. Um, what it also indicates is that there is still some, if you consider this boost vaccination as a kind of challenge with an autopox virus, what it actually is, um, that there is still some active immunity here at the two years time point, um, which is something that can be uh, boosted, you know, equally high, whether or not there was one or two doses initially. So let me summarize. Um, the uh, non-replicating MVA-based Chinias vaccine is, uh, has a very favorable safety profile with significantly fewer overall adverse events uh, in the direct comparison to AKM2000. Importantly, in contrast to the replicating vaccines, it has no signal towards these inflammatory cardiac disorders. Um, the immune responses are comparable um, with the, um, in terms of vaccinia specific PRNT at peak or even higher than those with the replicating vaccines. Um, the boost data at the two years time point are indicating a strong memory response, irrespective of whether the initial vaccination regimen was a single dose or the standard two dose regimen. Uh, it's an easy to administer subcutaneous injection with a standard uh, dose and schedule given four weeks apart. And um, in summary, this is a vaccine that we consider as suitable for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox in the general adult population without the need to exclude some populations that otherwise would have contraindications for receiving the replicating vaccines. Uh, with that, let me conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm, of course, open to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that ex uh, extensive ex uh, review. Um, are there any questions at this time? Dr. Ratmar. No, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Ms. Bata. I, I'm sorry. I, I clicked the wrong button. Can I give my question? Of course you can. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, th thank you for that uh, clear uh, presentation. As I recall, MVA was originally developed back in the 70s to somewhat attenuate the response to, um, to the vaccinia vaccine and to be used in immunocompromised uh, 
patient populations. And that was around the time that uh, smallpox was being eradicated. Um, when we were looking at it a couple of decades ago, it was kind of hard to tell what kind of efficacy data there were against um, smallpox and when it was administered alone. And I know it's different than the product you currently have, but um, are you aware of uh, any efficacy data with an MVA-like uh, construct against uh, smallpox in those historical studies? Um, no, in fact, in fact, not. So thank you for this question. It's appreciated because uh, um, that, that brings us back to the historic roots of our company. So this product was initially developed at the Bavarian State Vaccination Institute in the 1960s and 1970s and was indeed um, registered, I don't say approved because it didn't adhere to the current standard. It was registered in Germany and it was administered to 120,000 children in Germany in the early 1970s. Uh, it was initially supposed, as you mentioned, to be a pre-vaccination uh, for the replicating smallpox vaccine strains. And interestingly, you know, I, I'm born in 1973. I'm one of those children in Bavaria who received it. In my vaccination booklet, I have it in there and never received the replicating one after that uh, because they were discontinued roughly at the same time. Um, so at this time, of course, when these 120,000 doses of MVA were administered in Germany, we, we no longer had active or circulating smallpox in Germany. This is why um, we have a large body of experience in terms of um, safety, although of course at this time it was uh, safety was not captured in the way we are used to it uh, now according to GCP standards. Uh, but in terms of efficacy, there is uh, um, I don't see that we can really have a meaningful readout when it was given in in a geographic region uh, where there was simply no circulating smallpox at that time. Thank you. Ms. Bata. Thank you for this um, presentation. I just wanted to go back to the, the study regarding cardiac safety um, of Genios vaccine. Um, you talked about six cases that um, were thought to be causally related, but not serious. How long did you follow up those individuals? Yep. So the, uh, that uh, depends a little bit on the trial. Most of the trials had a standard six months follow-up period. So we had a, um, an initial um, period of uh, four weeks post the vaccination. So uh, basically eight weeks into the trials where the subjects had frequent site visits and where they also had these targeted physical exams. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, pre and post vaccination ECG and troponin testing. Uh, and in all of the trials, we had then at least a six month long term follow up that uh, was possible to be done by, by phone conversation, but at least we had another contact uh, to the vaccinated subjects to follow up with them whether they are doing okay. Um, in one of the trials, it was a one year follow up, but uh, yeah, six months to one year, depending on the trial. Dr. Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. Um, can you uh, describe a little bit more thoroughly any possible um, studies, additional studies, or uh, uh, exploration for indication in pediatric patients, given um, that monkeypox uh, can have pretty devastating effects in children? Yes. Uh, so, first of all, um, with regards to the smallpox development that we initially had in mind when we developed the product. Uh, we have a, a pediatric waiver for that indication because in the absence of smallpox, um, there was a, an agreement that it would be unethical to perform uh, this interventional trial in, in children. Now that we have monkeypox, um, when you look at specifically the US, the last cases of monkeypox imported to the US were back in 2003. There is also no circulating monkeypox in the US as of today. So it's still uh, not really feasible from an ethical perspective to run pediatric trials in the US. Um, of course, now you could think about running such trials in African countries. Um, what we were instead of looking at and what we are trying to, to summarize, and there is already some data about to be published, that's when you look at the uh, MVA as a vector platform, as the vector backbone, 
Um, I mentioned the MVABN Philo construct that is uh, used as the boost component of Janssen's heterologous Ebola vaccination prime boost regimen. Um, they have generated quite a number of pediatric data that is about to be published soon. Um, and we are trying uh, uh, to combine this with data that we have previously generated in pediatric populations with other recombinant products in pediatric populations um, and hope to, um, to be able to give a more kind of comprehensive uh, overview of that in the near future. Uh, but we are, we are not planning, um, if, if that answers your questions, we are not planning right now to run a specific pediatric trial for either smallpox or monkeypox with the smallpox vaccine itself. Thank you. Any other questions from the liaisons or from the voting members? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next presentation by Dr. Hudson. Variola virus plaque reduction neutralization assay for the vaccinating against monkeypox in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with Genios. Good day, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Wonderful. Um, so today I'll be giving a brief presentation on our variola virus plaque reduction neutralization assay for the assessment of Genios vaccine sera. And I am in the Pox, Rice, and Rabies branch at the CDC. Next slide. So I'm sure all of you know, but all of the known remaining variola virus stocks are only in two repositories within the um, world, one at the CDC in the US and one in Russia. All of studies with live variola virus must be conducted in a BSL-4 laboratory and they're all highly regulated and must be approved by the WHO. Next slide. In collaboration with Bavaria Nordic, um, we sought and obtained WHO approval to look at serum from a Genios non-inferiority clinical study. So this was the phase three clinical trial that Heinz mentioned that had 200 vaccinated naive subjects and looked at vaccination with either Genios or ACAM 2000. And as was previously mentioned, Sierra was taken at pre and peak time po points with the peak time points differing for the two vaccine regimens. SDA had the primary endpoint as vaccinia virus Western reserve neutralization. However, they did request that a subset of samples be tested directly against variola virus since it had not been used um, in the eradication campaign. Next slide. So we changed some parameters of our assay to make it more similar to Bavaria Nordic's print assay and to increase our objectivity and quality control measures. After these changes, we performed reproducibility and sensitivity evaluation of the variola virus prints. These results were written up and submitted to the FDA as a redevelopment report. We also um, submitted an analytical plan which summarized the methods, samples, statistical methodology, responsibilities, and timelines for testing the clinical trial samples in the variola print. Next slide. And I just wanted to give a very brief overview. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with a plaque reduction neutralization test. Um, and this is specific for variola. There are some slight differences depending on the virus that is used. With variola, we incubate overnight um, the serum and the virus. We do 12 different dilutions starting at 1 to 10 and going out to 1 to 20,480, and those are run in duplicate. After that overnight incubation, we then infect our monolayer with that virus serum um, combination for one hour before adding overlay. This is allowed to grow for 96 hours in the case of variola. And then you can see on the bottom that after 96 hours, you add the crystal violet stain and any virus that has not been neutralized is able to be seen um, as a plaque or that clearing of the cells. Next slide. And one of the quality controls that we implemented um, for the Bavaria Nordic prints included the use of a CTL analyzer, which allowed automated counting of the plaques, as you can see in this slide. Um, next. 
This also allows some additional quality control measures, such as if greater than 20% of the monolayer is um, removed, then that well is automatically rejected. Alternatively, if there's some monolayer that is missing, but it's less than 20%, the CTL will actually normalize those plot counts so that well can be utilized. Next slide. And then you can see in some of these wells, there's a difference in staining. So generally we have one counting template that we use, but when we have to change that um, or alter it so that it can count with these different um, staining colors, all of that is captured by the CTL. So it keeps very good quality control um, records. Next slide. So once the redevelopment report and the analytical plan were approved by the FDA, we did receive samples from Bavaria Nordic. A total of 200 blinded samples were received that were organized into batches. There were 100 pre-vaccination samples, 50 from each vaccine regimen, and 100 post-vaccination samples, again, 50 from each vaccine regimen. Each batch contained four samples, a pre and a post from one Genios vaccinated individual and a pre and a post from one ACAM 2000 vaccinated individual. So if one of those samples failed um, testing quality control, then we would repeat the entire batch. And here we have an overview of our results once this testing was finished. When you look at the 50% neutralizing titers of Genios um, vaccinees, they trended slightly lower than ACAM 2000, but this was not statistically significant. And we did some additional comparisons, such as the average full, full rise and the proportion of groups to reach 4X or 8X rise in titer, and none of those comparisons saw statistically significant difference. Next slide. So in summary, in the absence of a dermatologic take in these next generation vaccines, it's really important to use in vitro neutralization as a surrogate measure of efficacy. And variola virus neutralization in particular is very informative when the vaccine wasn't used during the eradication campaign. This data gives us increased confidence that the vaccine would be protective against smallpox. And I'll just mention that CDC has received WHO approval to do additional in vitro work with live virus to examine the long-term titer neutralization levels from Genios vaccinated individuals. And specifically, um, we hope to test some of the samples that Brett Peterson will be talking about in his next presentation. Next slide. And thanks very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions from the voting members? Dr. Atmar. Click the right button this time. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about the power of the um, analysis that you were do doing. It looked like there was a, about a fourfold difference in antibody neutralizing antibody titer between the ACAM 2000 and um, the MBA PN. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, biologically, that's often considered to be important, um, although I guess we don't really know what level of antibody is protective in people. Um, what, what kind of difference were you looking for or able to, to uh, expect to detect um, based on your analytic plan? What kind of power did you have? So this was certainly not um, meant to be a non-inferiority study. Um, this was just a subset of samples from that study. So we had enough numbers to do a statistical comparison, but um, it was not meant to um, determine if Genios was inferior or non-inferior to ACAM 2000. So we can certainly say there's a trend. Um, in this group of individuals we looked at, but it wasn't statistically significant and our numbers were not high enough um, to determine non-inferiority. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from the group? Okay. Um, Dr. Peterson, um, I believe you're next, although I don't have the title of your talk on my agenda. Or at least you're listed as the speaker. 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. So as the slides are pulled up, uh, good day again to you all. The, the title of my uh, talk is uh, Vaccinating Against Monkeypox in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with Genios. <clears throat> And so my goal for this talk is to give an introduction to this ongoing study. Um, by way of background, monkeypox is caused by the monkeypox virus, that is an orthopox virus. Its clinical presentation is very similar to smallpox. It presents as a disseminated vesicular pustular rash associated with uh, systemic symptoms of fever, malaise, and lymphadenopathy. Um, it's primarily acquired through zoonotic transmission following contact with infected animals, although there is human-to-human -human transmission via respiratory droplets and lesion exudates. The animal reservoir is believed to be small rodents, such as rope squirrels, Gambian rats, and the dormouse. And monkeypox is being increasingly recognized as a re-emerging disease. There's increases in monkeypox case reports. Um, from uh, many new countries that uh, have not reported monkeypox in the past or have not re reported them um, for many, many years. Um, and as uh, Dr. Weinthaler referred to, there have been exportation events as well to the United States, the United Kingdom, Israel, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. Um, and with these last import, uh, exportation events uh, occurring within the last two years. All of these exportation events actually are originated, um, all of these recent uh, exportation events uh, originated in Nigeria, which did experience a large um, outbreak in 2017 and continues to detect um, uh, sporadic cases to this date. Um, and I think the experience in Nigeria has highlighted the nature of the reemerging infections with monkeypox, um, as well as pointing out uh, how much we don't know about how and why monkeypox uh, appears to be reemerging. Now, looking at monkeypox in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in DRC, they have had endemic cases for many years and report the most number of cases um, in all of the African countries. In 2019, they reported 5,060 monkeypox cases uh, with 103 deaths, giving a case fatality rate of 2%. CDC has engaged with DRC for many years um, uh, to provide uh, enhanced surveillance in one of the provinces where monkeypox is endemic. Um, as part of this collaboration and, and program, uh, approximately 500 samples from suspect monkeypox cases are submitted per year, of which uh, approximately 300 are confirmed to be monkeypox. We've calculated an approximate annual incidence rate in this province of 4.4 per 10,000. And of note, we found that uh, the incidence rate uh, in healthcare workers, self-reported healthcare workers, is actually almost four times that uh, incidence rate with 17.4 per 10,000. And uh, even one out of 100 of the confirmed cases that have been identified have been those in healthcare workers. Now, in terms of preventing monkeypox, it, it can actually be quite difficult to implement the public health measures that would prevent the disease in these austere environments with uh, limited resources. So even simple measures like avoiding contact with animals, um, isolating infected patients, using appropriate PPE when caring for monkeypox patients, and performing good hand hygiene, all of these can be uh, difficult to uh, accomplish in these areas. Smallpox vaccination was noted to provide over 85% protection against disease acquisition in studies of close contacts of cases. Uh, and these studies were performed during the smallpox eradication era. However, routine smallpox vaccination has not been implemented as a prevention uh, measure for monkeypox, largely due to the safety profile of the traditional smallpox vaccines. However, with the advent of the third generation vaccines, as we've uh, discussed, um, there has been interest in evaluating these vaccines for the prevention of monkeypox, um, as this does provide a unique opportunity to um, uh, evaluate this uh, vaccine in an area where there is actual uh, natural uh, orthopox virus uh, infection. And so with this in mind, CDC began a collaboration with the DRC Ministry of Health and the Kinshasa School of Public Health in 2015 
uh, to develop an investigational new drug protocol uh, to evaluate the Genios vaccine in a prospective cohort of adult healthcare workers at risk for monkeypox in DRC. And the objectives of this study have been to evaluate the safety of Genios, evaluate the immunogenicity of Genios, and lastly, to evaluate the effectiveness of Genios to prevent naturally occurring human monkeypox. In terms of the study design, uh, the vaccine was administered to participants on day zero and 28. All participants are monitored over a two year time period um, and study visits occur on the, on the days uh, indicated here. Um, at each study visit, a blood draw is performed uh, for immunogenicity evaluation. Um, on each vaccination day, an adverse event diary is given uh, for the safety analysis and an exposure, exposure diary is completed throughout the study to document any contact with uh, confirmed or suspect monkeypox patients, um, as well as any disease occurrence in the study participants. The study began with the enrollment and vaccination of 1,000 participants in the Schwappa province in 2017. Um, these individuals received the liquid frozen formulation of the vaccine. More than 97% received two doses, and we have seen excellent return rates uh, throughout the study for follow-up visits with 88% returning um, for visits through the two-year time point. Um, this first cohort has completed the two-year monitoring period, and no monkeypox disease was identified among participants during that two-year monitoring period although there has been one study participant who was vaccinated in, with Genios in May and June of 2017, who did develop monkeypox in November 2019 and was identified through routine surveillance. Due to the success of this first cohort, there was interest in expanding the study to evaluate uh, another formulation of the vaccine, this being a lyophilized or freeze-dried formulation. And 600 participants were enrolled and vaccinated in two different health zones in the Schwappa province in 2019. Again, almost all received two doses of vaccine and we've continued to have excellent return rates for follow-up study visits. To date in this cohort, we have not seen any vaccine associated severe adverse events nor any monkeypox disease. From the first cohort of 1,000 participants who received the liquid frozen formulation, we have completed some preliminary safety analysis, um, local vaccine site reactions, as well as general systemic sy symptoms um, were observed in study participants, um, although at frequencies uh, quite lower than what was previously observed in clinical trials. When comparing previously vaccinated and naive individuals, Generally, less adverse uh, reactions were observed in those who were previously vaccinated as expected, but largely no, no significant differences. In terms of severe adverse events, there have been 12 study participant deaths reported in this first cohort. Um, however, none of these adverse events have been uh, determined to be vaccine associated as uh, other etiologies were identified as described here. And just for reference, the estimated annual average crude death rate in DRC is 9.6 deaths per 1,000 population. And what we have observed with this first cohort is um, six deaths per 1,000 population on an annual basis. Additionally, four female study participants did become pregnant within six months of receiving the study vaccine, despite being advised to avoid becoming pregnant. These Pregnancies were followed up to uh, delivery and three participants delivered healthy babies while one experienced a spontaneous abortion at an estimated 37 weeks of gestation based on her last menstrual period. And again, for reference, estimated annual infant death rate in DRC is 65 in infant deaths per 1,000 live births. We have begun performing immunogenicity testing on the serum samples collected. A total of 6,734 samples were available for testing from 999 participants. Um, in this first round of testing, we've performed an ELISA, which has been adapted for use to specifically test responses to the Genios vaccine. 
um, and we've completed pr both preliminary IgG and IgM serology analysis. And the overall seroconversion rates are, are shown here, 99% of participants seroconverted to IgG, while 24% converted to IgM. And going in just a little bit more detail in terms of the IgG immune response, um, broken out by naive and prior vaccination, um, you can see the kinetics of the antibody response is what we would expect with those with prior vaccination developing um, seroconversion at an earlier time point compared to those um, who are naive. And again, no significant difference on that day 42 day of uh, the maximal immune response in terms of seroconversion rates with 99% of those naive and 97% of those previously vaccinated um, seroconverting. And even out to day 730, that two year time point, um, it is being, seroconversion is being maintained in 77% um, of all of the samples. And with that being slightly higher in those prior vaccinated compared to those that are naive. And then looking briefly at the IgM response uh, of all the samples, 24% of participants uh, seroconverted. Um, it was higher in those naive with 50% of naive individuals uh, seroconverting and lower in prior vaccination, vaccinated participants with only 11% seroconverted. And that um, would be the expected pattern. And lastly, just providing a, a gross comparison to uh, seroconversion rates from prior studies from the investigator's brochure of clinical trial data available to date. Um, our ser seroconversion rates are, are largely comparable and to those previously reported results. So as mentioned, this study is ongoing. Uh, much work remains to be done in terms of evaluating effectiveness. Uh, we have collected the surveillance data um, from this area of enhanced surveillance and plan to evaluate that to uh, see if there's a way to indicate effectiveness. We'll also analyze the reported exposures to monkeypox. With regards to safety, finalizing the safety analysis and comparing with previously collected clinical study data and lastly, with respect to immunogenicity, the results I've presented here have been the ELISA results. Um, and we're very interested to see the, the neutralizing antibody response and are currently performing the uh, print analyses on these samples and hope to present those results to you in a future meeting. Um, this study is still ongoing in the second cohort. And so we're also very interested to compare um, data between the liquid frozen and the freeze-dried formulation of the vaccines. And there's also interest in looking at doing additional studies with this population um, to provide evidence of persistence of immunity. Um, as we've seen from Dr. Wienthaler, there is evidence for uh, a persistent um, immune uh, memory response at the two-year time point, but how long it lasts after that remains unknown. And so with this cohort, there is a plan to do a vaccine booster study um, at three or more years following the primary vaccination and collecting serum at those 0, 7, 14 day time points uh, to evaluate immunogenicity and um, the, the development of a, a memory response. So obviously many people have been involved and supported this studies and we thank them. But otherwise I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I see Dr. Hayes's hand is up, please, Dr. Hayes. Yes, I just wanted to point out that if a woman delivers at 37 weeks after her last menstrual period, it is not considered a spontaneous abortion. It is considered a preterm birth and you would document whether it was born alive or born deceased. Great, thank you very much for that correction. Dr. Fry. Thanks for a great presentation, Dr. Peterson. Uh, do you have any under uh, any information on the participant who developed monkeypox as it relates to any underlying conditions, comorbidities, or the antibody antibody status response to the vaccine, and how uh, and how severe the disease actually was? Thank you. 
Yeah, so with the individual who was vaccinated but later developed monkeypox, we are still trying to gather more clinical information um, to determine if that was a severe case or whether it may have been ameliorated from um, the vaccination. Uh, but what we do know about this individual was that they were 42 at the time of vaccination, 40 45 at the time of illness. Um, they were male. They reported being previously vaccinated, and they did have a scar suggesting previous vaccination. Um, they did not report any significant past medical history, although they were taking some medications at the time of vaccination, including paracetamol, as well as some artemisinin-based um, combination therapy for malaria. Um, and we have gone back and identified the samples from this individual. And this does appear to be somebody who did not develop uh, a robust uh, immune response. Uh, and it was at much lower levels than uh, those seen generally. Um, although we don't exactly know why this may be in this particular individual. So that's a summary of the information that we have available to date. Thank you. Dr. Hunter. I, I just have a comment. Um, I cared for one of the cases of monkeypox in 2003 for a few days in a community hospital before the patient was transferred to an academic medical center. I can attest that um, preventing mo monkeypox would have significant benefits uh, to the utilization of medical and public health resources in that kind of situation. And I'm just uh, thinking about uh, sort of theoretically that uh, in a clinical setting that uh, having a vaccine that doesn't involve an infectious lesion for a while um, could have significant advantages too. Just want to make those comments from a clin clinician's point of view. Thanks. Thanks for those comments. And, and we agree. Um, it does seem likely that th this type of vaccine could play a role in prevention of monkeypox. And that was largely some of the rationale behind doing the study too. Um, demonstrate feasibility as well as uh, effectiveness in the setting of natural monkeypox infection. Dr. Kimberlin. Can you comment, uh, David Kimberlin, uh, AAP Red Book, can you comment at all on antiviral um, drugs that have activity? I believe Sidofovir does. I'm not sure if the relatively newly licensed smallpox uh, drug does or not. Yes, so there are a number of antivirals that uh, demonstrate um, effectiveness against orthopox virus infections. Uh, the one that is licensed is Ticovirmet. It is licensed for the treatment of smallpox disease. Um, it would be expected based on its mechanism of action and animal study data to also provide benefit in treating other orthopox virus infections. Um, its use clinically has been limited in the fact that there are not a lot of orthopox virus infections to begin with. Um, although it has been used in um, at least one uh, infection in a laboratory and uh, involved exposure, um, but it has not been uh, widely used um, to treat these orthopox virus infections and has not been evaluated um, directly to treat um, monkeypox, for example. And, and in follow-up, is there any, uh, would there be any opportunity to provide um, the, the smallpox drug you mentioned for in Africa for uh, patients who, who acquire monkeypox and are being followed as part of this study? So there certainly is interest in evaluating um, these antivirals, particularly Ticuvermat and potentially others uh, for the treatment of monkeypox. Um, Limitations currently are, are resources uh, to, to do this, uh, although there are talks to um, it, pursue these types of clinical studies to evaluate the use of ticovirumab and other antivirals for treatment of monkeypox. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time and not wanting to really stifle, not wanting to stifle uh, um, discussion, but we are running over uh, schedule. I'm going to limit the questioning to two more individuals, um, and then we'll move on to the next uh, to a uh, break. Excuse me. So, uh, Dr. Bell. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, uh, this is for the presentation. This clearly is a, a very important 
um, study done in um, quite challenging circumstances. I'm just interested in understanding a little bit more about um, the epidemiology of monkeypox at the time of the clinical trials um, and verify my presumption that given the expected incidence of monkeypox among healthcare workers in general in this area and the size of the trials that you really, it's, it would, it's going to be challenging to actually say a whole heck of a lot about effectiveness. So could you just sort of comment and reflect on that, please? Thank you, Dr. Bell. Yes, I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, even though this is an endemic disease and, and it affects quite a few people in even these areas of high endemicity, the frequency is still quite low. So in terms of study design and, and doing the ideal type of um, randomized clinical control trial, um, it, it was not really possible to feasibly do that um, given the, the rarity of the event. Um, so we designed the best study that we could under the circumstances and the data available. And so what we've tried to do is to power the study to detect a difference um, uh, in these healthcare workers over this two-year time period. Um, and that was the um, calculation that we made that we may be able to, to demonstrate some effectiveness um, given the retrospective data that we had available um, if we were able to monitor uh, and reach a certain number of monkeypox infections over this two-year time period. So we're still in the process of evaluating um, that kind of effectiveness analysis and, and what we'll really be able to say. Uh, but we, what we do also have is um, the exposure data, and we do know that uh, part study participants did have contact with patients uh, with suspected or confirmed monkeypox. And so our hope is that the combined um, effectiveness analysis, demonstration of um, exposures uh, in combination with the immunogenicity will provide a, uh, a convincing um, uh, argument for effectiveness for this vaccine to prevent monkeypox. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I misspoke. Um, following uh, Dr. Schaffner, um, we'll have the final presentation by Dr. Rao. So Dr. Schaffner, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for all of these very nice uh, presentations. This is just a comment on, or perhaps we could ask Dr. Peterson to just comment on a, a small element of his first presentation. It's just to put things into perspective. Uh, we recognize that out of the CDC stockpile, about 200 uh, individuals, laboratorians receive uh, receive ACAM 2000 uh, each year. Uh, but in the military, I, I would think many more uh, recipients of this vaccine occur each year. Uh, do you have any idea of, just to put this into perspective for the, uh, for the members? I know we don't deal with military issues on the ACIP, but just to let folks know how, how much of this vaccine is being used uh, each year. Yeah, so thank you very much for that comment. And um, it, it really is good to uh, distinguish um, the civilian smallpox vaccine uh, campaigns um, from the military uh, vaccine campaigns. The numbers I was quoted quoting are uh, the number of smallpox vaccines being used in civilians and uh, smallpox vaccines are being um, administered to um, uh, uh, active duty military personnel. I don't have the exact number on me um, at the moment, I'm going to certainly get that, but it is in you know the thousands of uh, military personnel that are vaccinated annually. So, so that number does clearly dwarf the uh, civilian population that's receiving smallpox vaccine. So that is a very good point to uh, bring up. So thank you for that. Very good. We'll move on to the, the final uh, presentation of this section. Uh, Dr. Rao for next steps. Thank you. All right, next slide. So Genios is a new vaccine for orthopox viruses. And for that reason, the work group determined that ACIP's consideration, consideration of it requires a policy question, systematic review, grade, and ETR before the committee can vote on a recommendation. Next slide. 
The work group drafted this policy question listed here, should Genios be recommended for persons who are at risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses? So this policy question is about whether ACIP should recommend Genios and is not intended to be a preferential recommendation of Genios over another vaccine. Uh, next. The, the population part of the PICO is persons who may be at risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses, and that could, for example, include research laboratorians, healthcare workers uh, who administer vaccine change bandages or involved in clinical trials, um, as Dr. Peterson mentioned. The I in PICO stands for intervention. Um, intervention is vaccination with Genios, and the C is comparison, and our comparison is vaccination with ACAM 2000. And then the last component of the PICO is outcome. And um, the work group brainstormed about all the potential outcomes that could impact the committee's decision to vote for or against recommending Genios. The outcomes the work group identified are listed on this slide. Um, those outcomes that would help the committee understand the effectiveness of Genios compared to ACAM 2000 are listed under the first bullet. They are, um, the first one is prevention or reduction of disease by orthopox viruses. And um, the second is immunogenicity against orthopox viruses. So just as a, a point of clarification, by prevention or reduction of disease by orthopox viruses, the work group is accounting for the fact that some orthopox virus diseases may be prevented by the vaccine, but others may only be reduced in severity. Um, so this first sub-bullet then would be an a, dire a direct evaluation of efficacy, and the second sub-bullet um, um, immunogenicity is a sort of surrogate for protection and it, and is therefore an indirect evaluation of efficacy. Moving on to safety, those outcomes listed under the second bullet are severe adverse events, myo and pericarditis, and then minor adverse events. And the work group then uh, rated each of these outcomes as critical, important, or not important to the decision of whether Genio should be recommended for persons who are at risk for occupational exposure to orthopox viruses. Next slide. Yeah, and then next again. So um, the, as you can see, the first four on this list were considered critical or important. Does it, um, can you go back one? What? Yeah, so the, the, as you can see here, the first four on this list were considered critical or important um, as, as shown with the red arrow and the, um, the, only, the only not important one in this list was considered minor adverse events. Only the outcomes with the red arrow will be included in the PICO question uh, grade and the ETR, and the one deemed not important will not. Next slide. So here's the slide now with the PICO um, completed and uh, as it was drafted by the work group with the four critical or important outcomes all listed in the outcome section. Next slide. So now that we have um, come up with a PICO uh, question as a group, we've begun working on a systematic review of the published literature. We know that there's, there's probably not going to be a whole lot out there, but just to ensure that we are gathering and um, everything that could possibly be out there, we're, we're taking the very systematic approach that we should. We've uh, met with a CDC librarian whose expertise in systematic review searches and developed the search terms Genios, Invimune, Invinex, and modified Vaccinia Ankara limited our search to human data, so no animal data, and searched the databases listed in this third, third sub-bullet of the first bullet. So um, Medline, Embase, Offren Library, CINAHL, NTIS, Scopus, clinicaltrials.gov, and Global Index Medicus. We're in the process of doing title and abstract sorting. There were 740 articles identified by these search terms, so certainly not not very many compared to um, um, other systematic reviews that we all have done. Once we complete the systematic review, we'll conduct the grade for all four critical or important outcomes, and then the work group will complete the evidence to recommend framework for each outcome. And we anticipate being able to present all of this to the ACIP committee during the February 2020 meeting and could have a vote possibly as soon as June, if things go according to plan. And I'd like to thank the people who are listed here under acknowledgments and can take questions. Um, so we are open for questions. Dr. Hayes, do you have a question? Dr. Fry, 
do you have a question? No, it looks like not. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do right now is take a, thank everybody for their um, work on these uh, presentations. Um, we're going to give you all a break, um, five minutes, and then um, so we'll be back here um, at, what time is it now? At uh, 3.11, so 3.06, 3.16, we'll be back. Thank you.